So Jefferson, the the second week, you talked about love and action, and your verses were Luke ten twenty five through thirty seven. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you was what was going through your head and what you're thinking about that one? Yeah, I I love this story in Luke, right? When the legal expert stands and asks Jesus, "What must I do to gain eternal?" If if you think about your Sunday school days as a little kid. And there is every VBS, right? There's a whole number of stories. Like <laughs> yeah. you, you learn about David, you learn about Samson, and you learn uh, about uh, the Good Samaritan. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's a core story. And you know, as as a preacher kid, you know, a preacher's kid, I I can't count how many times I've heard a sermon mm-hmm. <laughs> on the Good Samaritan, good and bad, right? Uh, <laughs> and sometimes from the same person. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, the thing, like the the moment that I begin to realize, is like, oh, there's a lot more to this story than just uh, is, is a story to do good. Mm-hmm. Was reading and and listening to Dr. King talk about you know the Jericho Road and to have a real connection to the reality of our everyday life. That this is an ancient story that truly lifts a mirror to us in the here and now and asks of us, uh, what does it mean to love another person? Uh, What does it mean to love your neighbor? What does it mean to love the stranger? Musicians and comedians are phenomenal in telling stories, in helping people think about their own lives and reexamine their prejudices and bias through the way that they tell stories. And, of course, Jesus, right, is a master storyteller um, that invites others into these stories that is really about them. And at the end of the story, is like, I know where Jesus is going, and then here comes, you know, a curveball, and it's like, did not see that coming. He was talking about me the whole time, and I didn't see it. So I began thinking about the Good Samaritan. What does it mean in our popular culture? How um, it is a popular term. The connection, you know, the or it, its original connection to the scriptures and the church have, has become very detached. That you can tell somebody who has never stepped into a congregation about it's like you're a Good Samaritan, and they will tell you thank you, you know, because they helped you in your time of need. But I think that there is a turn in that story and then for us in our lives of when we put a face to the person on the road, mm-hmm. it changes everything. Yeah. Some years ago when we were doing the fight for 15, right? It's like I, I fully support that. And I know people who make minimum wage, but am I willing to give up? a part of of my income so that they can have a better life. It's like, well, that's a different question than do you support raising the minimum wage? Like we have conversations about, you know, recidivism, but do you support having a halfway house in your neighborhood next door to you? Like those are very different questions because one of them is hypothetical. The other one places us face to face with ourselves and our values. And it reminds me of the continual need for growth. The love is always calling us to go farther than we think we can go. And to always move from from a theoretical way of thinking to a very practical way. I worked at UM Com for many years on on um, 8th Avenue and would walk around those blocks and there's like a whole lot of homeless folks that they're occupied, you know, on, on house rents that are downtown Nashville. I had to ask myself constantly the question, what is, what is the loving act here mm. for me to do, um, right? Because you can just pass money, you know, here and there and is that a truly loving act? And... For a season, for me, the loving act was being involved in a soup kitchen during my lunchtime. 
I would go and sit with people and pray with them and hear their stories because it was a way that I that it, it puts flesh in the idea of love. And it gives my neighbor, the neighbor who's a stranger, a name and a face. Say, you use the word scandalous. I mean, it, it, Jesus was so countercultural. And, you know, especially using this story and who he used in it. And, and I love what you put in here about the significance of it would have been. I mean, you put in here, we like telling a white supremacist story with a, a, a black guy as a superhero or an African slave where the master was a good guy or a Democrat, a story of praises Trump or a Republican story where Hillary Obama saves the, saves the day. I mean, it is so such a countercultural story that he's trying to tell here. Yeah. And I, people just don't realize that. The, the story, the impact of the story. And for us to just take this story so lightly, you know, about the Samar- Good Samaritan, it's just like people just don't realize right. the significance of this. You know, yeah, it's like what is the good of, of loving people who love you back? Exactly. <laughs> it's like there's there's no challenge in the faith for that. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, you know, I, I would tell uh, congregations that being a Christian inside of the church, right, during our time of worship in Sunday school, is the easiest thing that we can do. Yeah. Because everything is going our way. But it becomes really challenging when we step outside of those four walls. When we get back out into the world and you're sitting in traffic and somebody cuts you off or a, you, you get a terrible order or whatever the, the, the situation may be, that's when... Our faith is to bear fruit. Yeah. Uh, that's when the transformative power of the Spirit is to shine so that others can see. Right? I can virtue signally all day, but I show who I am as a person of faith when I am met with adversity. Mm-hmm. And I choose to go in a different direction. Well, it's kind of like that idea, too, of like, who are you when nobody's looking, right? Yes. Like, it's one thing to, you know, when everybody's at church and you show up and you're, you're there. Uh, it's another thing when you're in your car by yourself and there's nobody to say, Hey, <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. maybe you shouldn't start shouting at the guy who just cut you off. <laughs> I think people, um, they think of the good Samaritan story as well. It's just being, it's being nice. It's just being nice to people. Um, and it's way deeper than that. It's, it's a, it's a hard, nice. <laughs> right. And it's like, and in some ways, nice has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that was not a nice action. It was truly loving, yeah. Yeah. right? Because it cost. Not only he placed himself in danger, it cost him something. Yes, right. So that it was, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping to help a person that has been hurt, and I could be hurt myself. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna go out of my way now, perhaps, uh, to make sure that they are cared for, and that their care is paid. Yeah. And I am going to come back right. mm-hmm. to make sure that whatever was needed was accomplished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if for whatever reason there is something that was missing, I'll make it right. Mm-hmm. So there, it was a giving, it was a, a true giving of oneself for another who couldn't, Ask for help. Yeah. Well, in a crossing of, of sort of human-created barriers, right? Yes. Of, of cultural barriers, religious barriers, of saying, that person is not my friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And still, I'm going to go do the right thing and go, right. and go care for that person. Right. It's, and, and it's the acknowledgement that those barriers are barriers that we create. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That they don't exist for God. And we have true... And, and I think that the story, in a beautiful way, names that. The, all of the boundaries that were created, all of the people that we all thought should have known better, and they didn't do the right thing, and here comes this person that we would think very much less of and ignores all of the risks because that was a loving act. It was what was needed. Mm-hmm. So, so how does this story speak into the struggle with race today? It calls us to look at the humanity of each other. I think there are a lot of the conversations that we have about race in and outside of the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's about labeling people. Mm -hmm. So it's not about uplifting the humanity, but it's 
in some ways about diminishing uh, one another. When at the end of the day, the goal for me is for us to see each other as beloved mm -hmm. children of God, a God who loves us regardless of who we are. Right. That your place of your 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 birth nation, your language of origin, it's like none of those things matter. What matters is that you are one created in the image of God who is worthy of love and dignity. I think that the story invites us to look less at ourselves and more at those who are in need. Um, one of the things that I think is it's something that we can all carry forward in this story is to have deep curiosity about who we are, who the other is, and how can I be involved in their lives, not for my own benefit, but so that the love of God can be reflected in all of our actions. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that I often ask people is, who is around your table? All right, it's, I think even, even for, for people that believe that racism is not a problem and, or that are, are fierce allies and advocates, uh, it's a question that I love to ask. Who's around the t your table? Who is informing who you are? All right, that we, living in a world of sameness is not a healthy way to be. We are right. all invited to be, to, to see through new lenses. Right. right. So if as a person of faith, if I believe that the love of God can can overcome the barrier of sin and the chasm that exists between us and the divine, I have to believe that it can also overcome the challenges that we have with one another <laughs> and helps help us to see that at the end of the day, we are all in a common journey, yeah. right? You can divide the world in whatever many pieces it is. We are connected to one another, right? Mm -hmm. So that, like, and we see this in schools, that hunger in the school, like, it, it, it doesn't matter who the kid is. If they're hungry, they're hungry. Mm -hmm. The call is to feed them, right? Like, if somebody's in need, the call is to answer the need. The temptation to ask questions about why, if it's not grounded in so that there can be a solution for the problem becomes not about love, but about judgment. Mm -hmm. um, that the call of love is for us to see people in the way that God sees them. And anything less than that is not about the love of God in us, is about our desire either to be right or to have control, or something like that. There was a social commentator in the early days of YouTube that he would talk about. But oftentimes, you end up asking the, the wrong questions when we talk about racism. Like, so, so if somebody stabs you, like you, you can care less that the person acknowledges that they're stabbing you or that they stabbed your upper torso or this is really your ribs or whatever else. So it's like, the thing is, stop doing it because your action has caused the harm. And whether you acknowledge it has caused harm or not, harm has been caused to the recipient. So that I think that in our conversations about race is what harm, well, we, we need to focus on outcomes, right? What harm has been caused by these actions? Right. Um, the cabinet has asked me intentionally asking a question, how does the actions that we take further the beloved community? And it's a beautiful question. I think that for them to ask and for all of us to ask, you know, as a community of faith, whether in a small group or in a big steeple church or in a church with 15 people, how do the actions that we take further the beloved community? Very few places, right, around our map are uh, still fully segregated. Mm -hmm. There are people who look differently yeah. than, than we are. It doesn't matter where you are. There's always somebody who, who looks differently. Right. So how can we help them to see themselves as a part of the community of mm -hmm. faith, right. the community of love and forgiveness, the community that not only speaks about love but, plays, but, but, but makes love actionable? 
Juarez, and, and I believe that, you know, the, the throughout the Gospels, that's the thing that Jesus is doing. So that he's always in the middle of some situation where somebody doesn't belong. And he creates a home for them. Right. Like you can talk about Zacchaeus, or he's in the home of some Pharisee and the you know, at this lush dinner and here comes this woman and starts washing his feet, or the home of Lazarus and uh, and Mary and Martha, or wherever else that he is, that there are always groups of people that don't belong but find a home with him. Right. How can we become those people? How can our congregations, how can our small groups become places where people that the world may reject will feel at home with us? So that there can be a conversation about race. It can also be a conversation about gender. Mm-hmm. It can be a conversation about sexuality. It right. can be a conversation about I- immigration status. It can be a conversation about almost anything. Right. It's like, what is the call of faith? I think that beloved community question also invites us to let go of our ego, mm. right? So it's not about me and what I'm going to gain or lose, but it's about the community. Right. And so how can how can my actions further that? I feel like that's a it's a beautiful question because it, it invites us to kind of extend beyond ourselves, right. and, but and and not that not that who we are is is not good, <laughs> and not at all. But but the all the gifts that we bring, everything that we bring, it's it's not about us. Ultimately, it's about right. it's about that community and what God's doing there. And, and and that's easy, like for us to have that kind of conversation. And but I, that may be harder for people who are in their tradition. I mean, I, you know, the Pharisee. You know, true, but but I think it's a, it's an invitation to growth, and in the sense, so I I am an immigrant. I spent eighteen years what? of my life. You may hear or not in my voice, <laughs> uh, or see it all over my face in in another country. And when I first moved to the U.S., a friend said uh, who had lived here for many years, he said, "You know, the most difficult thing is not learning the language. It's like you're gonna learn the language." The most difficult t- thing is adapting to a culture that's not your own and realizing that no matter how hard you work or how hard you wish, that's not your culture. Mm. You have to embrace it uh, anew. And w- when as time, and I'm now in, living in the U.S., this is like year 22, uh, the longer that I have lived here, the more... I have understood what he has said. Like when we had kids, it was like all of the lullabies, I knew not one of them. It was all new. I had to develop a deep curiosity to learn with and not to just impose my own culture on them so that it wasn't a work uh, of, it, it wasn't a work of division or subtraction. It's like we are adding and multiplying so that it became a richer experience for me, for the kids, for Linda. We could have drawn lines in the sand in saying that either we live in this country, these are the things that we're going to do, or this is my cultural background and that's what I want my kids to do. Or we can say we can create something new mm-hmm. and give them a very unique experience that allows them to navigate in a very complex world. And for me, the invitation of faith for all of us is always that, that you can be grounded in your beliefs, you can be grounded in your practices, and at the same time, accept that there are faithful people who do other things. And you can either sit in judgment or you can be in relationship. And it doesn't mean that you give up. It means that you can gain more. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my very best friends in the world is a Muslim. The faith of my upbringing was, you do all that you can to convert. Mm-hmm. Protestants in Brazil would convert Catholics, would, would like fight very hard to help Catholics come to know Jesus. And it's like, they know Jesus. That, that in our relationship, we talk about faith a lot as a uh, Christian pastor, do I want him to have a deep relationship with Jesus? Of course I do. 
cry. I, I you know, I, I pray for my friend, and, and and we have a beautiful relationship that is not based on the differences that we have, but the common uh, faithfulness. And and I've learned a lot about myself, a lot more about my tradition, and his tradition. And I believe that one day we will all know better. One day it could be that the continued search that he has will lead him right, to profess faith in Christ. But it's not the fact that he is not there yet is not a reason for me to cease relationship. Right. So it's it's a humbling thing that calls me to suspend judgment on him and myself and understand and trust that God is at work. And I, I think that it's the, as a United Methodist, it's, it's the beauty of our theology, right? That God's grace is at work in us, calling and wooing us towards the towards the, the divine. And if we are to take that seriously, we have to then place ourselves in some awkward and difficult positions because God is at work. And it, it's my, I feel that it's my call to live faithfully and witness through my words and actions of a God who loves us regardless of who we are and what we do and is always calling us to deeper relationship with the triune and one another.